Again, I want to thank Professor Delpy. Um, you know, a lot of you may be familiar with SBRNet. I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to also, uh, Dr. Delpy, address some of the specific topics that you listed in um, the email that you and I exchanged today, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. You know, I know that a number of you are working on uh, year-end projects, and I know that a number of you, uh, you know, were probably were using data um, as part of that project. I know that a group of you or some some number of you are working on a project with insoles. It just so happens that my partner, Mark Sullivan, is the nation's number one expert when it comes to insoles. So if you're the on the insole team, we got the right guy here for you. Neil, I would prefer to think I'm the world's foremost expert on, uh, <laughs> on insoles. I, I know more about insoles than I ever dreamed that I would. And seriously, if anyone out there has any questions, uh, our emails will be at the end of this presentation. So seriously, I spoke to three insole manufacturers today. So I'm uh, just <laughs> bursting with knowledge to share if anybody needs any help on that. Yeah, you know, uh, Neil and Mark, I was not sure if you were joking or if you were serious when you said you were the world's <laughs> insole <laughs> expert. Well, just, uh, I'll, I'll explain how I, I, I came to that uh, knowledge. Uh, in my previous life, I founded uh, a major trade show called The Running Event. And at the running event, we probably had every insole manufacturer in the world uh, participate in that event. So I got to know them and learn. I've been to factories where they make them. I've been to retailers. I've interviewed them. I'm up on all the latest scanning technology. So no, uh, sadly or not sadly, I was not joking. So the insole group, you can do an impromptu primary research right here. <laughs> If you have any questions about how the best way to uh, sell insoles. So what the students did was they, uh, well, Evan, do you want to explain what your group did? Yeah, sure. I can, um, I can take just a little, uh, little intro. So um, basically we, our, our research question at least was um, kind of, kind of how to make this sports startup insole um, kind of, kind of grow and kind of turn into more of a kind of a sports trend. So building popularity. Um, so basically we researched some, some other similar startups uh, that kind of burst onto the sports industry, such as Under Armour and, uh, and Stance Socks. So we used some of the data from that, um, kind of studied some of their tactics and we kind of posed our research question and some of our data based on you know, some of the tactics that they use. Um, and kind of tried to modernize it a little bit to fit today's industry with social media. Um, so we took our best shot at that. <laughs> well, I'd love, love to see it. And Stance is a great comparison because when you think about Stance, you know, we talk about commodity categories all the time. Socks are one, hosiery, insoles are another. But I think what Stance did is they really took sort of a branded uh, creative approach to the sock category and they are just crushing it. Look, it doesn't hurt that they have seventy million dollars in uh, VC money behind them, but you know I think their approach is genius, and they continue to uh, sort of outperform my expectations. And it would be interesting if somebody took that same approach with uh, with insoles. People seem to be moving in another direction, and I don't want to steal any of Neil's thunder. But seriously, if you guys want to take the conversation on insoles offline, I'm I'm happy to have it. Great, that would be awesome. Thank you, appreciate it. You know, Evan, the interesting thing is if you do a little work even on Google search trends um, and you find out right now what are the dominant search trends that people are looking for, you know, not just when it comes, you know, not insoles specifically, but if, you know, you look at what people are looking for in terms of shoes, in terms of, you know, what they're wearing, in terms of what they're putting on their feet, the number one term that comes up in more searches than not will be the word comfort everybody's looking for comfort. And, you know, the reality is as, as we get older, Mark and I are a little older, um, you know, we see comfort in our feet. Um, you know, plantar fasciitis becomes an issue. Um, some of us have probably put on a little bit too much weight and that's not helping um, our foot pain or our knee pain issue. Um, vert you know, back alignment. You know, there are so many variables that really go into that particular subject. I am even not the expert. Mark knows a whole lot more about this than I do. But I also know some of you are working on sports gambling. And uh, that's something that 
Um, just to give you a quick overview about um, SBRnet, uh, Mark and I actually bought SBRnet in January of this year. We've been running it since last August in the middle of the pandemic. SBRnet is an aggregator of data, and we currently get data um, in three separate kind of buckets. One is that there's an awful lot of free data out there. And, you know, as you know, firsthand, you know, all you got to do is a Google search to find out, you know, what's out there. There are sources like Statista. There's uh, the, you know, U.S. Department of Commerce. There, there are so many sources of data out there that you could, it, it, sometimes you don't even know where to start. And I run into that also, by the way. Where do I start? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Where do I start moment? because that's super important. The second thing is that we buy data and we purchase a, num a lot of data from places like, and Dr. Delpy knows from the SFIA, the Sports and Fitness Industry Association. There are a number of industry associations out there that provide data related to their specific business. Hey, we're in the sports business. So, you know, why not get data from the Sports and Fitness Industry Association? We use their participation data. We also get sales data from a number of other sources, but we also make our own data. We are a primary research, a primary creator of research. And we just did a fantastic piece of research, if I do say so ourselves, um, during the pandemic. Because we wanted to understand the changing nature of the sports fan during the great pandemic of 2020. And what happens when you take out one of the single most important variables from being a sports fan? Anybody want to kind of chime in on that? Anyone? Can't go to a game. Guess what? Can't go. No games. You know, stadiums not open for people or a limited number of people. So when you take the fact that people cannot go to games away, you're taking a big part of sports fandom away. But how do we make up for that? How do we, how do us sports fans, and I am one, and I'm sure most of you are too, how do you make up, um, you know, for that, you know, for the Jones, for the miss that you have and not being able to attend live sporting events. Um, we conducted a primary survey in Q4 of 2020, covering a number of key elements. Dr. Delpy, is there any way to share um, a screen or are we pretty much limited to this? No, no, you can, uh, there's a big green button. Uh, right. Wait, I may need to make you, you should be able to have it. Do you see the green? I see, oh no, no, I use, I use Zoom all the time. Yeah, so the green arrow there, you should okay. be able to click and then just share. Okay. Let me know, everybody, when we're seeing our screen. When yep, you're seeing we're my good. screen. Okay. So what we did was we wanted to explore the elements of fandom or the elements that make up fandom when you can't go to games. So we looked at things like esports. We looked at social media engagement. We looked at streaming media. We looked at fantasy. But one of the big things we looked at was gambling on sports. Because everybody that we speak to, and I even sat in on a webinar today from Sportico, and, you know, right now, everybody's looking at sports gambling as an opportunity to make up a lot of the revenue that is, you know, that is lost by not having fans at games. Now, aren't a number of you working on a project right now related to sports gambling? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, you want to share what your project is? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, we looked at, um, you know, what motivators sports bettors have and their preferences for online or in person betting. And ultimately, mm -hmm. um, like we were trying to answer, like if a venue or a restaurant applies for a DC license, which will be handed out in limited ability, um, is the price of investment worth it? Um, in terms of like, will these betters actually come to your bar just because they can place a wager? Right. That's an interesting, I think, an interesting way to approach, you know, this particular topic or, or approach this particular situation. What we did in our study, and I'm going to try to skip ahead a little bit. I've got like too many screens going at once here. Not my, uh, okay. I want to move it. I'm going to move right to the sports gambling part of this. 
But what we found when we looked at sports gambling, hang on, was that different sports fans have different tendencies in terms of the way they are planning on consuming gambling. We're finding out that people that play fantasy sports make for a much better target when it comes to sports gambling and for a variety of reasons. We're finding also, you know, which sports are people gambling on, you know, beyond the NFL, everybody knows, hey, look, people are gambling on football, but guess what? They're gambling on golf. And in fact, not only are they gambling on golf, you are more likely to find somebody who's gambling on golf than the average sports gambler. So they're over-indexing a regular sports gambler. So our goal here was to be able to find those pockets, those targets, those idiosyncrasies of the sports gamblers that you will need in order to be able to draw them in. And Stephanie, was you were the person that kind of just did that presentation, correct? Mm-hmm. Stephanie, the interesting thing is that when you look at sports gambling, sports gambling has a slight problem. And the problem is generational. You talked about people going to restaurants, going to bars, and then maybe possibly, you know, the opportunity to place a bet on a specific sport. But if you'll take a look at the data here, you can see that the Gen Z or younger consumers ages 13 to 23 are the least apt generation to be sports gambling. Now, so, you know, while everybody is is hot to try to go for sports gambling, there might be a little bit of a problem here. And that problem might be generational. Have any of you looked at any of the demographics surrounding Stephanie and your team? Has anyone kind of looked at any of the demographics around sports gambling? And I'm sorry if I'm looking away. I'm looking at like two screens at once here. We uh, we checked the demographics. And unfortunately, because our population size was relatively small, we ended up having 170 survey takers. We had vastly majority males. Yeah. That's that. It was because it was passed out um, through a couple like Reddit groups and things like that. And then after that, it was people that we knew that we were sending it to directly. So the age group was pretty confined to us and male. Dr. Delpy, if it's not too late, I'm more than happy to make our sports gambling data available as, as well as any other piece of the sports fan study that we just completed available to your teams if it's not too late. Um, so, you know, if anyone wants to reach out, um, you know, to Mark or I, it's just Neil, N-E-I-L at S-B-R-Net. Um, Mark is M-A-R-K at S-B-R-Net. I don't know if that's, I hope I didn't uh, overstep there, uh, Dr. Delpy. No, I, you know, they turned in their assignment, but I think they may oh. still be interested in, they just turned it in tonight, but they, oh. you know, this may be interesting just to compare and, and look at what their data shows. Yeah. Well, also it's like, Neil and I talk about gambling all the time. It's like, this is the start of the conversation. This is going to be such a hot topic, such a growth area. There'll be tons of jobs in the uh, gambling sector, whatever your personal feelings are about it. Both Neil and I are sort of, you know, I, I, we don't know if individually we love the idea of all this sports gambling, but uh, it, it's certainly a factor and it's here to stay. Right. Can I say a couple of things? And then Zach has a comment too, but you know, your golf over, over index, but I heard that it also probably happened because golf was the consistent sport during COVID. And so people didn't have any other things to bet on. So they were betting on golf. Now that may stay because they found it interesting. I just don't know whether, you know, that's a limitation in your study. It's not a limitation, um, Dr. Delpy, because that's what was going on during the pandemic. So the question becomes, what will stick and what will not? So, you know, like any good study, you know, you're looking at a slice in time and a, and a period in time. When next year, when we do the same study, now we actually do the study twice a year. Um, we may go back and actually ask some of these questions in Q3 when we do the second part of the study, which is more brand focused. 
But, you know, we're looking at what happened during a slice in time. We're looking at what's happening now. And, and the other thing is that we are trying to help people break through this, what I like to call now the assumption barrier. Because right now, all the things we think we know, all the assumptions that we've made about what we think we know are now wrong, are just wrong. The pandemic has changed everything, some for the better, some for the worse. What's going to stick? What's not going to stick? Will golf, you know, golf enjoyed a huge jump in participation during the pandemic. Why? It can be done in a socially distanced way. Walking, huge jump in participation during the pandemic. Why? It can be done in a socially distanced way that also allows for people to socialize. But what's going to happen when, you know, when uh, the green, you know, when the bat signal goes up and the green flares say, hey, you know, we can all return to 80% or 90% of what our lives used to be. What's going to happen? Are some of these behaviors going to stay or are they going to change back? I don't know. And I just have one more question about the, the age. I mean, third, I, I believe most states have said it's 21. Oh, Zach, is that you? Yeah, you took it my is. comment. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it's you. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, would it be fair to say the jury's still out on Gen Z just because of the age of the population? Also, like the lack of disposable income or average disposable income for that age group? Well, I think all those things, Zach, are accurate. But I do think that, remember, if you're looking down the road, I mean, if you're looking at that today, I, I think you're 100% spot on with your comment, 100%. But remember, you know, when we're looking at now, let's say high school seniors or college or I'm sorry, high school seniors going into college now or those, you know, will they have, let's say, the same habits and behaviors as their 24 to 39 year old millennial older brothers and sisters? And I think because look at the interesting trend here. Start with the boomers, my and Mark's generation. I'm not I, Dr. Delpy. I'm not speaking for you on this one. OK, thanks. But. I'm a baby boomer. So if you look at the baby boomers, we are much less apt in terms of the total amount of gambling than, let's say, the Gen X, which are almost two and a half times more apt to be gam sports gamblers. But then if you look even against the millennials, it takes another jump in a positive direction. But it goes down, you know, with the Gen Z. So. You know, Zach, remember, you're not just building a business for today, you're building it for tomorrow. So if you're looking at, hey, you know, we want to be in position, you know, to grow this business, not just for the next two, three or four years, but five years down the road. You know what? Those kids that are going to be 18 five years from now are going to be 23. Neil, another good question about golf in the chat. Go ahead. I didn't see it. Uh, I'm your I'm your hype man. That's uh, I'm telling you. It says Thomas. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I can Good. read it. I Good. Read it. Uh, so I was just curious if golf, if the if spike in golf could be attributed attributed to the legalization of sports betting because without the legalization, you're only really getting odds to win. At least from what I've understood, odds to win maybe round matchups. Whereas with a legal sports book like the FanDuel book, you can off get a line to win the top five, 10, the to top 20 to top 40 to make a cut, to miss the cut. Um, any player against any other player in the field. So I didn't know if that, like the availability of uh, market would be a big uh, in that. Neil, I'll take a swing at that and then you can. I hey. think I think that's a, a fair <laughs> point. And I, I think Professor's point was fair also where there was a, a period where, my God, golf was the only thing going on. And like we, as sports fans, we were all, so starved for sports, we were like going crazy over the Michael Jordan documentary. So I, I think that's uh, a big part of it. I also think if you know anything about golfers, they are inveterate gamblers. If you get involved in a, if you're a serious golfer, they, man, there were all sorts of bets always going. I've been sitting in golf clubhouses where guys were betting serious money on the next person who walks through the door, what color shirt will they have on? Golfers will bet on anything. And Neil, jump in here. Didn't, didn't the survey all show that golfers were more likely to bet on other sports? You know, they I think they over-indexed big time in that regard as well. 
In fact, Zach, if you're targeting, you know, you're looking to target growth or you're looking to target opportunities, you know, the data that we have, um, you know, says exactly what Mark just mentioned is that golfers are more apt to actually in an indexing situation to be a better target than let's say people that bet on the NBA or bet on some of the other sports because they are more likely to be gamblers. So, you know, it allows you as somebody who's trying to target a specific audience to be able to target an audience that is more predisposed to that particular activity. And I think a couple other factors work there too. Probably age golfer golfers tends to skew a little older tends to skew a little more affluent. And, and those people, uh, as, as Neil's data shows here, those people are more likely to bet than, uh, than other people. Dr. Delpy also told me that there are some groups working on some social media things. Does somebody want to kind of get me up to speed on that? Yes, no, maybe. Did I get that right? Sydney? Sydney Mann? Yeah. Yes, our group is doing um, research on the impact of Twitch and TikTok, but Generation Z on social media. You know, that's a really, that is a really an amazingly an interesting area of our site because we do social media in general, social media. Um, oh God, I'm missing the word here. Getting old sometimes stinks. You know, the social media interaction and social media usage by different sports fans, you know, as you can see, is is really all over the place. You know, where we're seeing, you know, we saw Facebook on a two year decline. We saw Twitter actually on a two year decline. We saw Snapchat, you know, kind of flatten out over two years. But in 2020, you know, we've just seen social media usage of for sports fans across almost every major sport just explode with the exception of YouTube. But what it appears that what YouTube has lost, TikTok has picked up. Now we did not measure fan we did not um measure fans of um Sydney, what was that other service you just mentioned Twitch. also? Twitch, we didn't Twitch. like Twitch. Twitch. Right. We didn't Twitch was not included as part of um, the base study. But the interesting thing is the folks that moved out of, out of YouTube, it appears have moved to TikTok. Shorter format, uh, more youth oriented, uh, action oriented. I mean, there's just a number of things that I think go into that particular situation. But we really do see, you know, some changes going on as a result of the pandemic. I'm just curious, students, would you agree? Like, have you less than your amount of time on YouTube to go other places? Well, I was just going to ask, you really think it's the same audience that's moving from YouTube to TikTok with such dramatically different formats? You know, what I haven't, what we haven't done is to analyze whether it's incremental audience gain or moving, but, you know, look, I've been, I've been working with data a long time. And when I see certain patterns emerge and you see, you know, a, a particular service grow at a similar rate or a similar value to what another service lost. Well, my first thought always, you know, I, I always go the zero sum game as someone grows, someone goes. So as new social media platforms, you know, come online, they become more relevant, they become targeted towards different um, demographic groups, you know, we will see, um, you know, some, I think, some shifting going on. I mean, you know, what was interesting to me, frankly, was the decline in both Instagram and Twitter um, among sports fans in general across the major sports of course, that number then popped up again in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. But again, being able to take this data apart a little bit more, I think it would be a wonderful exercise. Students, what did your re results say? Where were people going for social media? Sydney, what was your results? Um, we found that more people were like using TikTok when we were first like looking at it's more TikTok, Twitch is not as popular for sports yet, but the presence on TikTok is more than Twitch. What did but you hear about? I'm sorry, good. I'm sorry. No, overall, though, 
like you asked them which platforms they used. They used um, when we, overall we seen people using um, YouTube, um, Instagram, TikTok. But when we were first doing when we were first doing research, it was more heavily on um, Instagram and TikTok. But I think also because when you like you said earlier, the pandemic there was there was more usage of TikTok and stuff. Sydney, I want you to focus on two. Are you? Can you see the, the chart that's up on the screen right now? Yes. So I just want to pull two of these charts out of here and talk about it for a minute. Look at the Twitter chart. So we look at 18, 19, and 20. What do we see? Well, Twitter, for the most part, has usage in 18, 19 stayed flat. You know, lost a little bit, um, but pretty much stayed flat. But look what happened with Instagram, where we see Instagram almost across the board in from 18 to 19 dropping down Instagram usage, and then all of a sudden, of course, bouncing back up again in 2020. But then we also saw the emergence of TikTok. Sydney, what do you think that that tells you just, and and look, obviously, I know you haven't had a chance to analyze the data per se, but what does it tell you in terms of the way that sports fans are consuming social media or utilizing it? I think sports fans are more, are using, utilizing um, social media more just to, especially like when it comes to highlights, if they miss the game or to engage with their uh, favorite players or just to keep on date with their favorite players' life. And I feel like because we were in a pandemic, the, the numbers are higher in 2020 because we're, we're, we have more time to focus on what they're doing versus when you just catch it, it's spur in the moment. You know, the interesting thing about the growth in TikTok is, of course, we all know what the origin of the word fan is, and it's fanatic. And if you look at, you know, a lot of the videos and a lot of things on TikTok, it allows people to really kind of act out their, you know, their, let's say, you know, take that whole, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, there's some interesting, I think, again, this is top line. If you dig into this further, I think you'll find that there's a lot of not attrition as much as there is cannibalization and movement to from pl- platform to platform you know i'm curious so your numbers between um instagram and tiktok are identical for every year on the breakdown mm-hmm. so it's interesting to me because the penetration of tiktok in 2018 was so much smaller but the distribution of the sports is identical to instagram for three years in a row I have a feeling that just might be a mistake <laughs> that I didn't pick up to be perfectly honest, because that's not, those aren't the numbers that I remember. So somebody might have copied and pasted something wrong and it might've been me. <laughs> no, but so, that, that's, that's a good question because TikTok as a platform has exploded. So I, I would expect that, uh, I would expect the numbers at some point are reflective of that. If you want, though, um, I'm happy to send you the actual summary report that this was derived from. And and there the numbers are right. It looks like I, you know. Wouldn't that be great to share? Would that be happy? Absolutely. And absolutely. And, you know, I hope, you know, look, if you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, you know, I hope you'll follow us um, on whatever social media platform you like to use, whether it's LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, or even a bunch of old guys on Facebook, or, of course, uh, Twitter. So um, are there any other questions or Dr. What, do you guys, what are you doing in esports? Wow. What we've done is we've actually done um, esports has really been one of the areas that we have, um, you know, done a lot of focus with. Uh, let me, let me, well, here we go. So, um, you know, what we're seeing is that a lot of sports fans, especially younger sports fans have turned their attention um, away from traditional sports and to esports, and um, we surveyed people that play what we call first-person shooter games: Call of Duty, Fortnite, Halo, Overwatch. Those games. We looked at um, those played at more of the fighting games, and then we looked at people who play sports games. So what we were able to do is to again break down um, people that are playing. Um, you know what effect esports is having. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, how much it's having on traditional sports 
And then, of course, general participation in esports. We're seeing esports participation. If you look at the chart on the right, is up um, pretty substantially across all, um, you know, all major groups of sports fans. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I think that's also going to prove a challenge. Quite frankly, I mean, we we had a discussion. I had a discussion with a, a, a company that's looking to do, um, that's looking to create an app that allows. Um, you know, esports activities to happen during an actual game and allows to put you into the game. You know, they're calling this the gamification of sports. It, I don't think it's probably an expression, Dr. Delpy. I'm sure it's something that's come up in other presentations. But, <clears throat> um, you know, more and more sports fans are showing their, um, you know, their engagement with esports. And frankly, I think it is something that traditional sports really needs to keep an eye on. And could you just go to that methodology slide? Sure. Uh, I think it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm stalled. Hang on. I love technology right. when it works. Okay. Right there. Yeah. So the survey was conducted, um, you know, in December of 2020, um, 3,475 respondents ages 13 and older. Um, we weighted the data so that it was representative of the U.S. population, you know, based on um, age, income, ethnicity, um, gender, um, household size, um, and income and geography. So what we did was we built a model of the United States population ages 13 years and older. And we made sure that our collection married up to that model to minimize any sort of weighting or any sort of you know internal bias in the data. And how do you find the, where did you send this survey? Did you buy lists or? The survey was done online. We used a traditional panel company. Uh, actually, we used a company called Dynata. Um, who, you know, maintains a consumer panel. Um, you know, it's an opt-in, it's an opt-in situation. It's not as though they're just sending out, you know, blind invitations to participate in um, the survey, but they do have um, a fairly rigorous um, program to, to ensure that these are not like professional survey takers to ensure that these are people that are genuinely interested in the in the topics are genuinely interested in um, taking the survey. And again, not just, you know, professional survey takers. And on average, how much does somebody like if you're on a panel, how much does somebody make for that? Well, it depends, uh, Dr. Delpy. Um, these people are actually not paid to be as part of the panel, they are awarded points. And then the points equal, um, you know, either money in some cases, or um, they will receive an Amazon gift card. So, you know, it's not a, you know, we are not paying people directly. And in fact, I have no interaction with anyone um, because of privacy laws. So I have no idea, you know, I wouldn't know if, you know, Evan took the survey or Thomas took the survey, frankly. Um, everything's anonymous. Um, we are very careful to maintain strict, uh, you know, strict confidentiality um, and don't want to violate any of the new, uh, you know, confidentiality and privacy laws. Okay. And I, I'm just asking this to bring home the point to, to what we've learned in class. This is kind of a summary of everything. Um, how long was the survey? Because you know, survey. we struggled with making sure the students kept their survey to a certain length. What was the length you suggested, just out of curiosity? I'll find out how much I violated that rule. Ten minutes. Okay, I definitely violated that yeah, rule. Yeah, we, we were longer. And um, But, Professor, you make a good point in that Neil's been doing this longer than I have. But typically, the longer the survey, you know, you get a dropout rate, you get fewer completes. So uh, this survey, Neil, I want to say it was... 28 minutes or something like that it was 22 minutes yeah i mean you could tell just from all the the data that we showed you when we got three times as much of this it, it, it was extremely extremely in depth we, but, we we had an incredible what i like to call hang-in rate you know we do measure the number of incompletes and we look at how many people 
um, for some reason, um, and the survey, you know, we, the people hung in, they liked the topic, they were interested in answering the questions. You know, we weren't asking people about toothpaste or, you know, um, you know, health insurance. So, uh, you know, we got a high, you know, we got a really, high, actually our, our, our incident rate was also really high. When I say incident rate, that's the number of people that qualified out of the total. So they may have 500,000 people in their total panel, but their incident rate or the number of people that qualify was very high. Yeah, I would not recommend to anyone that they do a 28 minute uh, <laughs> panel. Yeah, we, you know, we were stuck. I mean, we had to, you know, we had a lot of new questions we had to throw in there that we didn't do in the past. So, right. and then we had comparative data that we needed to continue to gather to, to maintain the integrity of our year to year data. So, yes, it was uh, a challenge. It was, was nerve wracking, but I, I we're pleased with the results. Right. And that, the SFI data, this was something that the Dix, um, we had Amy Waters from Dix speak last week. And I know Amy. Um, I, in a private conversation we had, she discussed she wasn't sure of the integrity of the SFIA data, um, just in terms of the methodology. I'm not sure if you've ever looked at that or not. It's a fairly large, I mean, you know, it's a fairly large sample size. I mean, of over about, I think it's up to, I think about 24,000 sample. Um, you know, what's interesting is that Dix used that data for a number of years to help with site selection. Um, in fact, I actually developed a site selection methodology for them to use participation data as part of that site selection algorithm. But um, that's interesting that Amy. Well, uh, I think it was more on... I think the way the question reads is, did you play basketball in the last 12 months? Well, okay. So if you picked up a basketball and shot one shot. No, you see, that's, see, Amy, I know Amy well. We ask people if they just picked up a basketball and took a shot, that would be called casual participation. I took a shot. I played one time with my grandchildren. Um, you know, or I went out with my buddies one time, but if you played basketball 24 or more times a year, would you consider yourself a basketball player? Anybody? Yes, I would. Yeah. Well, also, uh, uh, again, my background, a lot of it is in the uh, running space and I've looked at a ton of running data over the years and, you know, you you have people, uh, there's a number of ways you can gauge and measure avidity, if that's the right word, you know, how avid, how serious uh, a runner are you? How many days a year? How many days a week? How many miles? So, you know, there, there's all sorts of ways you can drill down. And um, that, it's I, I think the point that she raised has always been a question about participation data. Like if, if you go to the beach twice a year, are you a swimmer? You know, uh, so, but I, I think if you drill down to the data and get to the real numbers, the real numbers are, are good. Dr. Delpy, can I, I just say one thing real quickly also? One of the things that I've talked about, and I even may have talked about this way back in your class like five years ago when Mike Gugat and I were in there, but when you look at data, any data, there's really two things or three things you've got to focus on. Number one, and as Dr. Delpy just mentioned, is tonnage. You know, how many people are we talking about? Are we talking about a large number? Or are we talking about a very small number? Because if you're talking about a small number, small numbers can be very volatile. You can move a small number. If it's a big number, it's not going to be as volatile just by the nature of it. So you really need to look at tonnage, but you also need to look at trends. Where is the data going year over year? Is it declining? Is it increasing? Is this um, is it accelerating or is it decelerating in either direction? Am I running out of time, Dr. Delby? Nope, nope, they're fine. Okay. So, and then the last thing you've got to do is, and I talk about this nonstop, and Markle, Markle will back me up, is that it's so important when you're looking at data to benchmark what you're looking at. What is your data saying as opposed to the average? So are you more likely or less likely 
to be a gam- sports gambler? Are you more likely or less likely to be playing esports? So being able to look at the tonnage, the volume, the trend, I like to use the word trendage, and I know that's not really a word, but I made it up. So tonnage, trends, and benchmark. You got to benchmark, you know, against, against something. Because, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, that it gained 10% or it's up 10% against what? And I think that that's really important because people like to, you know, throw these numbers around a lot. Yeah, even within our own fan study, I know our soccer numbers uh, jump around quite a bit. And, you know, Neil and I drilled down on that. And, and part of that is particularly MLS fans. We were working off a small sample base. So, you know, if you interview uh, 200 people, you're going to get a much more accurate sense if you interview 1,000 as opposed to 200. So that's, I, I think, supports what Neil was saying as well. Right. Um yeah, and oh boy, darn! I just forgot something. Yeah, I, I've been I mean, there, done that. <laughs> oh, I know what I think the students would find of interest in talking about trends. Um, Neil, when you came in and spoke to my sports entrepreneurship class, it was uh, we did the case study around the ball brand. The what, what was it called? Um, the baller? The no, ball. it was um, um, the shoe. Br- it was a sneaker brand. It was. Um, Students, do you remember the ball? Mark, help me up. The guy, uh, big the, baller, the, big baller brand, big baller brand, big baller brand. Right. What, what was the fa- name of the family? The ball. The ball, the ball family. The ball family. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, Neil was saying, if you look at the trends in sneakers, because that's what his specialization is. It, you know, it's all, um, it was going down, like, and yet this ball, the baller family, or the ball family. <laughs> Not they could come in and somehow take over the market. Yes. So it was a good example of how if the Ball family may have looked at the data, it would have told them something that it's difficult to be well, successful. 100%. Well, uh, <laughs> I think also, I mean, once upon a time, basketball shoes were the casual athletic footwear of choice. And that is, and in the sneaker business, that's ancient history. You know, I think if you look at what's, uh, I wish I was in a classroom so I could look at everybody's feet, but uh, you're all home, you're probably not wearing shoes, but <laughs> skate shoes, you know, have, have a huge part of the casual business and uh, the running shoe silhouette, also a huge part of the casual business right now. So yeah, the balls either read, grossly misread the data or got some bad advice, but uh, yeah, that whole thing really, really went up in, uh, went up in smoke. Yeah, the interesting part of that also is that in a very this is a very unusual situation where one brand dominates with 93% market share, and that brand is Nike. Let me say one thing. Under Armour couldn't break in to basketball. Adidas couldn't break into basketball. Reebok tried to do it when Reebok actually had more market share than Nike, and they couldn't sustain it. So, you know, Big Baller brand tried to do something that no one else had been able to do previously and frankly and if they would have come to me i would have told them to go you know go do workout clothes or go do something else because you just aren't gonna be successful going yeah after- also i'm reading a good comment there from jonathan i mean also they were trying to go top of the market their shoes were like ridiculously expensive so it probably would have made sense to come in on the uh complete lower end of the market uh as as, as a few a few people have tried you know, the interesting, I mentioned Under Armour also. That's an interesting, you know, discussion probably for also another night about, you know, how data, you know, has really worked in some cases in their favor, but also worked against them in some ways. How would you say against them? I'm just curious. Um, I think that they, in some cases, they did not read the tea leaves very well. Um, they had the data. But rather than believe what it said and what it was telling them, they decide they they rather, you know, they let their own egos, you know, kind of say, oh, you know, OK, that's the data. But I really think this. Well, you know, unfortunately, that came back to bite them, too. Yeah. Well, also the thing with data as and, and you know, all the students in a couple of years, you'll be out in the workplace. <laughs> 
And there are certain times where, you know, your job will be to analyze data and draw conclusions. And then other times your boss will come to you and say, this is what I want to do, find some data that supports it. So, you know, data, <laughs> data can be selectively used and manip manipulated in a, a number of ways. True. I, I have one quick question. How many of you, and you can do just by raise a hand if you want, when you first got your topic that you were going to develop or you create society, did, how many of you went to like Google Trends just to see what the search trends are on the topic? Because that's the first place I always go. Always. So, you know, again, that's an easy, you know, easy step for people when you're, and you know, when you're given a topic, you're working on a topic, you know, go right to Google search trends. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I think we, I'm not sure if, I don't think we mentioned that, so. But we, we did have it, I think in one of our early lectures, we did uh, speak to some of it as an option, I think, but we didn't really go in depth. Um, I love your background, by the way. <laughs> Oh, good. Well, um, you know, thank you so much for jumping in and giving this, uh, you know, thank you very much. Lights here. Yeah, I'm and happy to do it. Yes, yeah, appreciate it. And all, all you insult guys.